Okay, one o'clock rock here on Think Tech, Think Tech Global. I'm Jay Fidella, and the fellow next to me is Richard Wertheimer. He's an investment advisor with Morgan Stanley, uh, and much more. Hmm. And uh, he is a very close friend of our host, Crystal Quark. Very close, very close. Uh, more than, yes. More than close. Uh, yeah. close Usually close. friends, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's debatable. I think she might have yeah, more contractual. Okay. Yeah, okay, well, all right. <laughs> but I'll take Whatever friends. it is, it's, it's, it's close enough. Anyway, so uh, we're going to talk about Go West to China Young Man today. Uh, and indeed, you know, Richard did do that. It's one of those great stories which I saw as I edited the footage mm. of some on-location uh, footage we took at the Harvard Club back in, I want to say May, it might have been April. Yeah, something like that. Um, and it turned into a really great discussion uh, with Richard sort of explaining where he'd been and what he'd been doing for the past, how many years, 30? 30, 30, 30, 32 30, years, yeah. 32 years, it's early mm -hmm. 80s. Um, and so I wanted to recapture that today sure. and um, sort of introduce him to you so mm -hmm. you can appreciate a guy who did what I admire very greatly. He picked up sticks, he went to China, an American adventurer, something perhaps we should all do, yeah? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think picking up, no matter what you're doing, whether it's going to China or going across the street, it is important <laughs> to try different things. <laughs> Uh, I had the benefit of being young and, um, and uh, I don't know what the word is maybe, uh, foolhardy or brave or you know, <laughs> foolish or, or, or I think naive is probably the better word, and just uh, decided to go and went, went for it. Well, so what made on. you make this decision? It's important for them. They okay. should know. To frame it. Um, I guess I, I had the, uh, I, I was lucky enough to spend a year in France, and uh, I'm a I was a, uh, came from a uh, humble background in Brooklyn, New York, um, which you know, didn't really know much about the outside world, a bit, but uh, living in France really sort of, you know, sort of opened my eyes to the possibilities of language and culture and just there's a big world out there. And as a, as a youngster growing up with Vietnam in the background, I was always intrigued about Asia. And Japan was obviously rising during the 70s and 80s. And so my attention was drawn that way. And for some reason, uh, China just was one of these big unknowns. It was huge sort of old culture and um, Japan seemed like it had already been, uh, already opened up and you know, there was a modern day Marco Polos were already there. And so I thought, well, let's learn Chinese and go to a better way to do it than to just to go there and was do it. it. Was it in that order? Learn Chinese first and go there or go there and learn Chinese? Now, it, was, it was, I think it was both. I think it was yeah. in order, having lived in France is in understanding that to really learn the language, the best way yeah. to do that so is to actually is to be an enabler yeah. when you go. Correct. And it's fun. It's more interesting. It's yeah. more interactive. I'm definitely yeah. that type of, an, you know, I'm, I'm less of a, more now, more of a, I can do the books, but at, th at that age, I was not as interested in school. Yeah. And so when I was done with high school, uh, I decided not to go to university. I just basically bought a one-way ticket and went to China, or tried. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that was... What, did you have a plan? Uh, did you uh, have a job, for example? No, no, I had no job. I didn't have much of a plan. I just thought I would wing it. Again, it, it, I think when you're... Uh, when you're younger, I don't think you think about the consequences of your actions. As <laughs> I seem to have that conversation with my kids uh, <laughs> daily. I'm trying to uh, teach them the same with different. Yeah, but it, yeah, it's, and you, and you kind of hear yourself in the background going, "It doesn't. They're not going to get it. You didn't get it. Why would they get it?" Um, and yeah, so I just kind of showed up there. I, I remember being on the flight uh, over, and, and I think the, uh, the the stewardess or flight attendant asking at me, you know. Where are you going? Where are you going to live? And I, was, I don't know. You know, I'm just going to sort of figure it out. <laughs> they have youth hostels here. <laughs> I hope. Well, I think, I, think I, I might have had a name of a hotel or something like that, but it wasn't. It wasn't hard. Yeah, that wasn't. You know, it was. It was uh, starting from a low base, and so that that was really the beginning of the, it. Was an adventure. That's what it was supposed to be. Um, and and oh. those are those are great memories. I mean, there were there were difficulties and there was a lot of unknowns, but I'm still here, and yeah. uh, you know, I picked up a couple of things along the way. Hopefully, yeah. mostly good things. Now, I remember from making the movie and yep. remarks at the Harvard Club is that you could only stay there for a certain time before the Chinese government decided that maybe you shouldn't be there. Yeah, back in those days, and I didn't know this, I didn't do a lot of research on it, uh, it was, China was still fairly closed, and in order to go, you had to be part of a university program. So when I went there, 
uh, I stayed for a little while, and then I found out that um, I had to leave, and uh, that, because I wasn't part of a university program. There were or, or a couple that had arrangements, but I wasn't. I didn't go to university, so I just uh, I remember asking the. Um, they said, "So you're going to have to go to." I said, "I want to learn Chinese." They said, "Well, you have to go to Taiwan." And in my, you know, attention wait, before. Wait, wait, we got to right. do this. Okay. So this is well, this is a, remember, a memorable thing. Okay, there was this conversation right. where they said, "Richard, you're going to have to leave now." Yep. And he said, "Where am I going to go?" Yeah. And they're going to. They say, "You have to go to Taiwan," and you say, "Taiwan? Well, I don't want to learn Thai. <laughs> As in Thailand." Yeah, I didn't know the difference. I wasn't really sure where Taiwan was. So yeah, they, 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 I ended up in Taiwan. It was great. A lot of folks back in the old days, a lot of uh, sinologists and, and, and just guys who were interested in China ended up in Taiwan because that was open, it was free, you can learn the language. It was, uh, so that's where, I, that's where I ended up. And then eventually when uh, things opened up, which was pretty quickly, um, I was able to go back to China. But oh, is that right? A, yeah, but I spent a number of years in Taiwan, which was great. Very different. I mean, Taiwan is a, it's a wonderful place. People are super friendly and nice, and particularly now as China has changed, and there's a lot of the, the So the how old were you in all this? As you say, out of high school? I was 19. 19? Yeah, I was 19. And, and by, by yourself? Ah, completely by myself. Yeah, on my own. Not many people do that. Did you ever feel, uh, at least in those days, a, a, a lack of security, a lack of safety, a uh, threat in some way by being this howly guy in the middle of a, you know, a, a, you know, a, of, a, of a Chinese society? Actually, I, I, I felt more threat in New York, I mean, to be honest. <laughs> I, I, I mean that, you know, sort of tongue-in-cheek, but really. I, it, it's a very safe place, uh, still is. I mean, whether it's Taiwan or Hong Kong or even China. Uh, China's done a little more... more chaotic, but it was very structured and very controlled. So there was no danger in terms of, there was a lot less danger from, from a personal point of view. Uh, the unknowns were the things that were, the, the things we weren't familiar with. That was, but that was the fun part. So no, I, I never felt that at all. Um, and you know, I think that even to this day, the kids walk around in the streets, you know, young kids going to school, taking the subway by themselves. So, so from that point of view, there wasn't that much. I mean, in the beginning, maybe a bit of apprehension because you don't know, but you quickly get a sense that that, that wasn't the, the danger. It was the danger of just trying to, the, the, the challenges were how do you get yourself understood and talking to people. English was a lot less prevalent then than it is now. Um, but there's still- Did you find you had a skill with language that you could pick up? Yes, I did. When I was in France, I, I, I had a good knack and I, for, for languages. I pick them up fairly quickly and I've got a really good ear so I can, I can imitate well. And that was part of the fun. It's like anything, you know, learning language is about time and interest. And if you have the, the two, if you have put the time in, and if you're inter interested in it, then it's great. You know, I think it, that, that, that's a, it's an easier way to do it. it you know, it's not forceful. It's, and I was, I was 19, I was yeah. interested in meeting, you know, yeah. young Helps ladies. And absolutely. That was one of the incentives. I mean, back then, sure. I mean, it was not being able to communicate with people and particularly wanting to find girls and, and have fun, uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was a big incentive. Yeah, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, oh, <laughs> even now, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's different though. It's a very different animal than, a, than what it was back then. Yeah, yeah. Then it was, then it, you were, particularly for China, it was like going to the moon. I mean, it was completely closed uh, society. The, the, the experiment, the, you know, the communists had been uh, running in China, very different from now. Now it's a very different animal in terms of what the what the excitement is. But then it was very super interesting. It really was like you were it in, was in transition. It, it was in transition. It was in transition. Hadn't even started. It was just starting. So you still had that old closed system where people tended to dress the same. They looked the same. Same haircuts and um, you know the the market economy hadn't taken off. It was still very closed and and and. and uh, you know, very regulated. How, how were you control. living? I mean, you were getting money from home, or did you have a job? I eventually, well, when I got to, so after I had enough money in China, I eventually went to Taiwan. I got a job working at a, at a trading company called, uh, I'll never forget it, Atachi. Not Hitachi, but A. Atachi. Chinese word. Yes. Uh, oh, it's just for A as opposed to H. That's oh, how okay. the Taiwanese did it. <laughs> um, and it's the trading company. I think they made irons and different type of... Uh, so you were driving products. a taxi also. Eventually, uh, over the years, I'd, I'd, uh, about a year or so, maybe two years into it, um, I worked for a number of different companies, and I ended up going back to university. I took the entrance exam in Chinese, which I failed miserably, and they, they thought it was social, because I didn't want to be with foreigners. You go through this Marco Polo They didn't want Polo you to scene. fail. Well, they, I think they wanted me to fail, but they wanted me to... Well, I, I think they, didn't, they were... They were Confused as why anybody would want to be in uh, why a Howley would want to go to a Chinese university, not with other Howleys. And that was the difference. For me, it was about language more than anything else in culture. I wanted to be with, I spent years of trying to be more Chinese than the Chinese. And then you wake up one day and you realize, 
you know, I like hamburgers. You know, it's okay. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I, um, you know, after you've been, you know, drinking snake blood and snake <laughs> bladder and gallbladders <laughs> and just, you know, all sorts of weird stuff. And I, I can still do it, but uh, you, you realize I'm from, like Brooklyn, I, I'm from I'm a New York kid. I like a hamburger. I like a good, you know, a good uh, pastrami sandwich. There's a place so. in Beijing, by the way, called Frankie's. I don't know if you're... No, right. I don't know it. Frankie's is a hamburger joint. Okay. You know? right. It's I'll really wonderful. It. Okay. Right. So, you, get, you know, oh, after you're finished with all the Chinese food adventure... Go to Frankie's. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. But back then, you didn't have a choice. There was no Western. I mean, there were very few outlets. Uh, Taiwan was the same thing. Hong Kong was a bit different because it had been, you know, controlled by the British, and it was that much more international. But I didn't want that at that point. I wanted mm -hmm. to learn as much as I could about China. And, man, and, and, and Mandarin has spoken China correct. and Taiwan. Correct. correct. And uh, and then you you wound up uh, not only driving a cab, but you I wound did. up playing on the Taiwan on national, national soccer team. Rugby team. Did, rugby. 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 Yeah. Uh, I played football. rugby in France. Football. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, rugby, rugby, actually. Uh, the, um, but they, yeah, so I, I just through, I guess, through the university, I met some folks, and I played rugby, and I ended up playing for the school team, and then I ended up playing for the, for the national team, which sounds better than it is. They're not bad, but... Uh, it was more for the experience, meeting people, and really, really, uh, uh, a friend of mine had a cab, uh, two cabs, and he's, he, he let me drive one, and I ended up driving, you know, becoming the first, and my, my guess is probably the only foreign taxi driver in, in Taipei. Um, I got stopped at a, the same red light twice by the same policeman with no license, <laughs> as you can imagine. That, that was an interesting conversation. The first time wasn't so friendly, the second time was friendly. He's getting used to you. He's getting you again, going through a red light. These were different days. There weren't as many cars in the room. You know, and, uh, again, things have changed dramatically. You can't do that now. But back then, it was, it was the wild east or wild west. Yeah. yeah, you know, but uh, you're right. I mean, I think it's a really important point. Over 30 years, over 30 whatever years, Things have been very dynamic in Asia, and and uh, you know, luckily there haven't been any major wars in that period of time. So there's been yeah incredible economic activity Correct. and growth. So you were there during the period of growth, uh, and of you know kind of a coming together of Asia. Lucky time. It's it's um, it is almost hard to put into words uh, the change the the the. the how dramatic that change is. And often I have to bite my tongue when I'm with people in Shanghai, or in, I spent most of my time in Shanghai, in Beijing, or just around China. Because I'm always pointing out and saying, you can't believe how much this place has changed. It, it is phenomenal, it's beyond belief. What they, what they have done is really, it's... it's uh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, that's You're telling the Chinese how their place has changed. Well, that's a, t yeah, that, that, that's a different conversation. When I tell people, people so, so you've been, so you speak Chinese, yes, you've been in China for how long, 30 some odd years. There aren't many folks. I mean, I was part of the first group. I wasn't the first group. There, there was one in front, uh, the, but I was basically that second sort of wave of, of uh, foreigners, of U.S. nationals, because there was normalization of relations with the U.S. that went in. And so when I tell people that I was there that long, often some of these, these folks, you know, it's a, it's a very youthful uh, sure. uh, 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 country. Demographic, yeah. Demographic, or was a big part of it at least. And they, they are, they like, I'm, you were there before I was. Or a lot of folks that have did the opposite, they ended up going to the United States. So I'll meet, I, I, sp I was in China while they were in the U.S., and I'll know things about China in some levels, in some ways, more than they will. <laughs> We're going to take a trip. break. Okay. That's, uh, that's Richard uh, Wertheimer. He's with Morgan Stanley as investment advisor. And he did go west uh, to China, a young man, as a young man. Uh, and we're here on Think Tech Global, and we're going to take one minute and come back. We're going to find out how this all translates to today's younger generation. I'm so excited to hear about that. Be right back. Welcome to ThinkTechHawaii.com. This is Johnson Choi. I'm the host for the weekly Thursday 11 o'clock show called Asian Review. See you next month. Hi, my name is Kim Lau, and I'm the host of Hawaii Rising. You can watch me live every other Monday at 4 p.m. Aloha. Hello, I'm Patrick Bratton. I'm the host of Global Connections. I'm also a professor at Hawaii Pacific University, and my show and some of the other things that we do is show soft the collaboration that we have between ThinkTech Hawaii and Hawaii Pacific University. So I look forward to seeing you and talking with you about a lot of issues dealing with Hawaii, the United States, and the world. Thank you very much.
Okay, Richard Wertheimer, China expert. <laughs> Are you a China expert? No, I, 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 I think I'm a, I, think I, I would say I'm a student, a long-term student of China. I think using the word as we were just talking, expert, I think is dangerous because it's a, in any place, particularly a, a country as big and as complicated as China, to say you're an expert on, on, on it is, uh, I think is dangerous. Um, but yes, I've been l looking, I'm familiar with China. Um, <laughs> Uh, but what, what I get yeah. is you're a guy who is um, adventurous and mm. curious and willing to go all in mm. uh, in order to, you know, connect up with a given culture, especially a culture outside the U.S. And so you immersed yourself. You, you really went to some length to immerse yeah. yourself. Yeah, I did. I mean, that was, that was part of it. Part of it was for language reasons and also cultural reasons. I didn't want to spend time with... Uh, with fellow uh, uh, Westerners, uh, that that was well, that was why that you could and you could still learn a lot and have a lot uh, a great time. But my path was that was my intention. Um, you almost have this Marco Polo syndrome in China, particularly in China and Taiwan as well, where you think you're the only one there, and you would see another foreigner and you'd be like, wait, mm. or you either you I would, thought you, I was the only one, or you would just ign you blank him, you'd ignore him. It's like he doesn't even you're exist. I can't be. I, this is my. So you know, there, there's a lot of romanticism with, with China. Obviously, that has completely changed. I mean, now, you know, the, the China today is a... The changes are... are, are yeah, I, I, well, it's, it's, it's not just Western and international now, and, and still very Chinese, but it's something new. It's, it's the future. I mean, that's when you, when you talk about China today and you describe it to people, and you say you should go there and you should get involved, because it is, in many ways, the future. And I think... Uh, not just the U.S., but I mean, I think the most of the West, I don't think they really fully appreciate it. Uh, we don't have the time to go into it right now, but when I made the, the footage, when I edited the footage of Richard's talk at the Harvard Club, there were some really sophisticated points you made about exactly how the politics works, mm -hmm. how the public thinking works, how the leaders relate you know, to the population. Uh, how they try to stay in power. I, you made some really interesting statements about power mm. and how people mm. need to stay in power, what they mm. need to do to stay in power. Um, things that we in, Amer in the U.S. really don't think about, don't know about. So that level of sophistication is... And we're going to post this, this, um, yeah. this show as edited uh, on OC16 next couple of weeks, so you should look for it. So anyway, so now you're in Taiwan. Yep. And somewhere along the line, you wind up in Hong Kong. Yep. But in, in Hong Kong, they speak neither Thai nor Mandarin. <laughs> they speak Cantonese. They speak everything. But, oh, they, okay. but, but right. you're right. But you're absolutely right. It is Cantonese. Uh, yeah, I, I had spent a number of years uh, in Taiwan and China at that point, uh, working the financial services uh, business, and then ended up in Hong Kong. At that point, I was already developing my career, and Hong Kong was the international city. And as an international city, it had obviously it's Cantonese, but it's English. I mean, the British were still there. It was still a British colony. Uh, it was a very easy place to live. Things work. It's the hardware versus software model. Uh, yeah. Like in China, the, the, they have all the hardware, but the software is still being developed. Um, whereas in Hong Kong, you've had 150 years of that software development. And so there's, it's, just, it's, a, uh, it's an international city. Um, and so I ended up in Hong Kong. No, I could not use my Mandarin. I mean, it's quite funny because when I first got there, as a lot of us did who were from China or Taiwan, we wanted to use our Mandarin. And you would go into a taxi or you'd meet people and you'd open up and you didn't want to speak English because you wanted to use your Chinese. You'd, you'd spend a lot of time <laughs> on that. what? And people would be, they wouldn't speak to you. They actually looked down because they looked down on China. But in those days, Hong Kong was the rich you know, yeah. cousin, the yeah. small. And yeah. the Chinese were, were poor country bumpkins. Yeah. Uh, today, when I go to Hong Kong and I speak in Mandarin, all people want to do is speak in Mandarin with me because the British are no longer there. This is a Chinese colony now, or a Chinese territory. <laughs> they know that soon enough they're going to have to speak Mandarin. Well, it's happening now. I mean, it's it, and you could, you know, for better or for worse, it is. You know, it, it has changed. I mean, this is things change. And, and the wonderful thing about having spent time in Taiwan and China and Hong Kong and having seen is that things do change. I mean, even in the United States, you kind of you watch. Sometimes we we're just, we don't expect. You think things will just stay the way it is, and it's not necessarily the way it is. If you look at history, I mean, there's always change is inevitable. And so you need to be prepared for it. And the Hong Kong people are dealing with that right now. Are you saying that Hong Kong is going to be, as I ex expect anyway, swallowed up into China? That China is, it, it, there may be uses to have Hong Kong look independent to a certain degree, but at the end of the day, Absolutely. it's swallowed right up. Absolutely. I mean, this, it's there, and, and I, you don't, I don't begrudge them. It's their, it's theirs. Uh, you, you, you can be all nostalgic for the old British days or, 
you know, the colonial days, but the reality is it's the Chinese, you know, China yeah. controls it. It is happening now. Um, I don't know if the analogy like the frogs in the water is being boiled is the right <laughs> one, but it is something like it's, that. <laughs> it's, ha it's happening now. If you're there, you, you, the, the fabric of the place is changing. You know, it's like any organization, uh, country, the top, the, the, the folks that control, the, the, the head man sets the tone, and that's it. And that basically, you know, and that's what we're seeing is that uh, the fabric, I think, of the place has changed. And, you, you were there and, for the umbrella. Um, I was there for, I actually was, uh, not the day of, I mean, I was still living there, but yeah. I, I think we were in New York at that time for some reason, I can't, I can't remember some, some, I mean, we wanted to be there, but I think we were glad we weren't because it was as momentum, the 97 you're talking about, yeah. right? Yeah, it, it, it rained like No, I mean, crazy. I mean with the umbrella people in the street. Oh, there, I was there, This was yes. about two years ago? Two years, yeah, I was there, that was strange. Uh, I, I think, unfortunately, uh, even though my heart might go out with those folks, I think it's just unrealistic. I think they yeah. need to wake up, and this is you're, you're, this is a fait accompli. You can't change China uh, controls Hong Kong, and uh, uh, as time goes on, it will be more and more within China's orbit. There's a, a sense of manifest destiny there, sure. and you know, I mean, I, I don't want to get too much into this, but there is other things to talk about. But you know, we, we've had the whole South China Seas business going on with mm. the tribunal in The Hague mm. and whatnot, a decision that, that it runs against China for mm. a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it seems like to me China sees this, that also as a manifest destiny thing. Historically, even although it's a little concocted, uh, historically they think they own the South China Seas and uh, they want more territory, they want more power, hegemony. Yeah. Um, and they're not going to stop. And maybe at the end of the day, whatever The Hague says, yeah, I, I, I think that's true, uh, but I think as I, as I mentioned in the talk, it is, it's the, the, the thing you always have to ask for China, at least the way I look at it, is what is the motivation to keep, or, or what is it that keeps the party in control? So everything starts from that. It's less that they're looking to be territorially expansionist, they want to have confrontation. It's more about what do we have to do to appease the masses, to appease our, the, the, our people and our constituents, whoever they are, yeah. so that we, this, the party, can justify our having control of, of the country. I think it starts from there. So that's always the first question you have to ask with anything, particularly international related issues, is that's what's driving it. It's not that China has some uh, desire to uh, to go global. I mean, I remember I was in Hong Kong. We were looking. I was I was at the George Washington um, uh, aircraft carrier with a friend of mine from the embassy, uh, uh, an American chap who was part of the first group of students to go into China, and we were talking in Mandarin with. There happened to be uh, a Chinese um, PLA uh, senior admiral individual. We didn't know that at the time exactly who he was, and so we started chatting and. And you know, one of the, the two things happened. One thing is he said, uh, this is a few years ago, this is before China, South China Seas, but he was adamant that having the American uh, uh, involvement, in, you know, that sort of Pax Romana, you know, w w w to, to keep things stable was more important at that. Now that's changing a bit as China sort of grows and becomes economically and politically and militarily stronger. The other thing was fun with that event. So here we are, two Haoli's talking in fluent Mandarin to this, Admiral, we come off the boat, and, and because nobody was with him, and you could see his handlers looking at us, going, "Uh oh, he's been compromised." You know, the, 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 get that man's get, name right. right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty funny, but, but I, yeah. So I think I think some of the, I mean, this is real. They are so they're they're, they're but I, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on that expansion. I'm not saying that the United States doesn't ha shouldn't uh, or the rest of the world pay attention and and and, and meet those challenges. Uh, but in a, in a, I think you have to put it in context. Yeah, you have to understand it, and you can't stand back like Donald Trump and and look at you know sort of this mono-dimensional kind of look at it. Mm. And uh, you, that's the point you made at the Harvard Club mm. too. Uh, the leaders in China, just like the leaders in this country, mm. um, have constituents. And they play to the constituents. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe in a different way, but it's the same thing. It's a different, I mean, they, they have a contract, a little bit different than what we have. But, you know, th th there's some similarities, I guess. But it really is, the, as, as China has been transitioning and uh, the, ec the economy is growing at a certain pace, it basically keeps people happy. But the, the contract is growth for political um, for, for survival <laughs> well, or for political uh, involvement in you so you're not really part of the political process yeah. you don't have the rule of law is not really carried out maybe it's in the book somewhere and in, in, you know the uh, but written on a piece of paper but it's not actually implemented I think that that is the difference and so and that's the the real as I mentioned in the talk uh, the China is going to have to figure out how to 
how to manage that. M my view is that they're going to continue on keeping their foot on the gas pedal to keep the economy growing yeah. until they can figure out how to make that yeah. full transition. It's very interesting to watch, mm -hmm. which takes me to my last question, sure. my last series of questions. Yeah. You know, it's, it's Richard Wertheimer and it's 2016. And Richard Wertheimer is out of high school. He's 19 years old. Mm -hmm. He's spent a little time in Europe, maybe he opened his eyes. And now he looks west mm -hmm. and he looks to China as, uh, you know, another adventure, a way to immerse himself in another culture and really, you know, live life to the fullest, if I could say that. Does he do that now? Is it different now? Absolutely. I, it's just a different experience, but it, it, it's even more important. Before it was more fun. It was an adventure. It's still an adventure now, but China now is the second largest economy in the world. It's going to be the first largest economy in the world. As I, think I was mentioning before, I think there's too few people in the West appreciate and actually take the time, make the commitment to learn and to really get over to China. I mean, I. I, um, so the, Chi the American Chinese. Well, yeah, I mean, American it's Chinese. harder for them, actually. They, they, have, they have a lot of baggage, if you will. <laughs> oh, you don't speak Chinese? You know. uh, it's not really fair to them. But no, I, I would, to the point that I think it's an incredibly exciting and dynamic place. It's exhausting and exhilarating at the same time. I mean, that's how I find China. And if you're young, it's great. I mean, yes, there's pollution and there's all sorts of problems on that front socially, but but is, a, is, is an incredibly fun and dynamic. They're trying and they're experimenting. They want to invent new things. So, I mean, even for, so the answer is yes, you should absolutely go. I, I basically uh, uh, strong arm my nephew uh, <laughs> to, to spend time in Shanghai. Now he's in Beijing. We did that when he was in university and now he just graduated and he's there and having the time of his life. So if I was 19 year old again, I would absolutely, you would find me in Shanghai or Beijing, probably Shanghai, I prefer that. Um, Vietnam would be also a very interesting place to go, but yeah. not 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 on the same level. I mean, that would be probably more of the the old the old school. But it's, it's all part of the same neighborhood, though. Mm. And you know, on a given weekend, you say, "I think I'll get out. I'll yep. go to Vietnam this yeah. weekend." It's yeah. all an hour or two away. Yeah, people are they're trying to. There's a sense when you're in China and they aren't resting. People are. I mean. That work ethic that y'all that work so hard—they really are working hard. I mean, they—they they, and they're willing to deal with all sorts of problems. They're not entitled. They're—we uh, have to be careful. We have to be there. We have to be educated. There's a reason why um, Schwartzman from Blackstone is, a, I think, a $200 million grant for Americans to go and learn Chinese. I mean, he's supporting those. This is—he sees that if you—if this is going to be a challenge or potentially for the for not not in a, not in a I don't mean that in a in a, in a Holocaust way. I mean, it might be, but it, you need to know your, your the the the, uh, the other players in the game. You know, uh, and so if you don't understand, we're at a disadvantage. And so for me, I, I, I've spent time and I've done it. Um, I would definitely do it again. I think we need more people to do it now. It's more important. If we don't, they're going to eat our lunch. I mean, yeah. it's, yeah. in some ways, they, said that having, too. having said that, though, they also have their problems. I mean, th well, we have to understand those problems too. We have to understand that. And that so it's not it's not not saying that it's it's a one way street. That, uh, that, but we do have to understand that because it could also. And I actually, if their problems, given the fragility. Of are our problems of their problems, they become our problems exactly, yeah. and that's why you need to understand. Well, this is now we're at the end of our show, Richard. Sure. This is when I usually turn to my guest and I say, um, you know, could you please tell the people? And uh, we have a picture of a bunch of kids drinking in a bar over there. Uh, oh. Could you? Could you tell the people, you know, give them your advice, give those 19-year-olds your advice on how to do this, what kind of frame of mind, how you, you know, pack up your stuff and, and go west, sure. young man, young woman to China. However, in your case, I want to make it a little different. Sure. Could you tell them this in Mandarin? <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> okay. Uh, 就是各位朋友如果要学这个语言
，主要是就是国内像西、呃、中国是比较有意思了。所以我说你去那边的话，不管是怎么去啊，不要跟这个外国人在一起啊，你要跟多跟那些当地的人要接触、了解、交换意见，这是非常好的一个机会。那我觉得未来。对你自己，对整个世界是一个好，是好，是一个好事情的。嗯、yeah. ，You know, I know a little Mandarin, so I want to make a final translation for the、okay. for our audience. What he said was, "It takes a little chutzpah, <laughs> but that's what you should do." <laughs> Thank you, Richard Wertheimer. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs>